those of you who are, are joining us on, on Zoom. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. Thanks be to God for, uh, for the beauty, and we, we pray for those who are, are digging out and hope that uh, everyone will stay warm and, and safe in this weather. So this uh, it's a big week. Christmas is just about here, and we have been We've been here on a, on a few evenings over the last few days doing some recording for the Christmas Eve service. The service will, will premiere at 5 o'clock on Christmas Eve, so you can kind of have that sort of live feeling at 5 o'clock if you want to watch them, but it's available anytime after that through YouTube. And Dougie's going to put it right on the, on the website, so if you just go to the church website, you'll, you'll see it there uh, starting at... Uh, at 5 p.m. on Christmas Eve, but I wanted to express uh, our gratitude to the to the many people who were uh, helping to make that happen and making beautiful music and sending recordings in. And I suppose this is an opportunity to remind you yet again, if you have a Christmas greeting video, or if you don't have one yet but you'd like to make one. In fact, I bet that Doug could record you. I was going to say, if you want help, I have a film on here, um, and then I have it. Don't have to worry about sending it to me. All right. Yep. He's got his camera, so yeah, if you want to record a short video greeting, he's gonna compile those at the end of the for the end of the, the Christmas Eve service and kind of share our greetings with, with everyone. So if you haven't done that and you'd like to see Doug after the service. Also, after the service today, before you uh, head back to coffee hour, if you're, if you're able to, to gather for that, we invite you to grab a pilgrim hymnal, one of the red hymnals in the pews, and and, and gather out on the front steps of the church, and uh, we're going to sing some, some carols. 
and uh, hope that we can find the right pitch to start on. But uh, that, so that's just a very informal thing we'll do uh, after after the post loot if you'd like to join us out front. Do, does anybody else have an announcement to share? I know Heidi does. Some of you may remember a few years ago we helped to sponsor uh, Syrian families through an organization called Rutland Welcomes, uh, <clears throat> another organization they work with called Bridge to Rutland. Uh, we heard from them last week that they will be welcoming uh, they can give me a number, but based on what they're asking for, 15 to 20 families. And um, <clears throat> there was a spreadsheet of items, and we committed um, to uh, 50 bars of soap and 24 can openers. So I forgot to make a sign, but I'll get it up this week. Out in the hallway, there is a red bin. So if you could bring in can openers and soap, uh, in the next few weeks, we'll get those over there. <clears throat> and there will be more opportunities for giving as the year goes by. But on the spreadsheet, they also asked for furniture, like beds or uh, dressers, anything a family would need to start up. They're not ready to take those things yet, but if you happen to have items, if you bought some new furniture, or you have some old furniture that you wouldn't mind donating, um, in the bulletin is my email address. And it's HP Webster 1. It looks small. If you click on it, it'll work, but it's a 1 at the end of my name. Email me or see me after the service, and I'll make a list, and then we can uh, let them know what we'll be willing to send over. And I can make sure those things get over there. So thank you very much. Other announcements? Just a, a reminder that the if you have a prayer concern you'd like to write down and share, those get collected, I think, during the first hymn. So now is the time to do it. There'll also be an opportunity when we come to the, the prayers to, uh, to use your voice to raise up a, a prayer concern. But if you prefer to write it down, uh, you can do that, do that here right at the, at the beginning of the service. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Judy. Good morning. Please call me up. Please join me in the call to worship. Beloved, incline your ears, for the spirit is stirring, and the sounds of rejoicing are riding the wind. Beloved, open your eyes, for a new light is rising, and soon the whole world will be filled with its glory. Beloved, raise up your heads, for the love of God is coming to restore the life of this world.
Psalms, we hear again and again, God's steadfast love endures forever. In the laws of Moses and the teachings of Jesus, we learn that the love of God and neighbor stands at the center of faith. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. In the early church, we see with the poet's eyes that God is love. We light this candle as a sign of God's wondrous love that is about to be revealed in Bethlehem. Let us pray. Lord, Lord grant that your love may grow in us, filling our lives, illuminating this world, and bringing hope to those who despair. In Jesus we pray. Amen.
Charlie is our only really young one here today. But actually, Charlie, I need your help up here with something. If you could. That's right, you don't have to sit down or anything. I, I'm just curious. Here, you can stand right here. I'm just curious what you notice about this, this crash, this thing to the scene. Do you notice anything about it? Well, yeah, that they're all gathered around baby Jesus. But I mean, about this particular set, do you notice anything interesting? Or anything strange? Does it look perfect? What's not perfect? Yeah, this this angel might have trouble flying. It it has maybe a third of one wing. Um, it it might. These, I don't know how long these. Does anybody know how long these figures have been around? Ever since the war. Okay. At least maybe twenty years, and they're made of beeswax. So you don't want to get them too close to a flame. I, I did that uh, the other day because I was trying to repair, jo here, pick up Joseph standing up there in the back. Do you notice something interesting about Joseph? The right, right there. Does he look perfect? <laughs> well, so when we took Joseph out of the box, he didn't have his head on. So... First, I thought, well, there, it's wax, so let me just hold it over a flame, and it's, uh, that was not a good idea. <laughs> so Doug helped me to drip wax from another candle on, on it so that we could kind of glue them together, but it's kind of, it, it looks a little strange. And so yeah, we have angels here with broken wings. We have Joseph, who's, here, can you put that back for me? He's got his head put back on. There's some animals that are missing ears. There are some shepherds who didn't even make it because they're missing their feet and, and heads. But you know what? I, I think this is great. I love this set because God doesn't come to a perfect world. God doesn't come to perfect people. God doesn't say, hey, you gotta be, you gotta have everything put together, and you gotta get straight A's, and you have to have the shiniest shoes, and you have to be a happy person all the time. God comes to us when we've got broken wings and when we're well. We won't go into the details about the headless people here. But but that that's the world that God comes to, and that's what Christmas is about. That you know, however you're feeling. And you know what? Sometimes this time of year, we don't always feel the Christmas spirit. Do you ever have anybody say to you, come on, get in the Christmas spirit? But you're having one of those days and you're not feeling it. Guess what? Christ is born for you too, even if you're not in the Christmas spirit. And God's love comes to us no matter how we are. And especially when we're feeling a little broken and when we're maybe feeling a little upset about something, God comes for, for us. And that's, that's good news. So let's, let's pray. God, we thank you for your love that comes to us to embrace us and lift us up when we feel broken or sad or like nothing is going right. God, we thank you that that you come to us, you come to this world to shine your light on us. God, we thank you for the message of Christmas. Amen. Thanks. Micah 5, verses 2 through 5a. But you, O Bethlehem of Ephrathah, who are one of the little clans of Judah, from you I shall come forth for me who is in the rule in Israel. 
whose origin is from old and from ancient days. Therefore, he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has brought forth. Then the rest of his kindred shall return to the people of Israel, and he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord and his God. And they shall live secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be uh, the one of peace. The second reading is Luke 1, verses 39 through 55. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to, to a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. And Mary said, My life magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. Will you pray with me? God, your word, your word is our hope. And we take refuge in it. We keep our eyes and ears open and we wait with expectant hearts this morning, this very moment, to hear and see and feel your living word flowing into our lives to make us new. God, come to us just as we are. Come to us that Christ may be born in us. We pray in his beautiful name. Amen. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. And sweetest in the gale is heard, and sore must be the storm that could abash the little bird that kept so many warm. I've heard it in the chillest land and on the strangest sea, yet never in extremity it asked a crumb of me. We need poets to remind us from time to time. Here Emily Dickinson reaches out of the past and invites us to consider hope not as something external to our lives, something that we have to journey far and wide to find, but as something that dwells within us, perched in the soul, Something that goes with us into the frozen landscapes of our lives and into the troubled waters to keep us warm, to keep the music alive. But that second stanza, we know about that second stanza. Sore must be the storm that could abash the little bird. We know those storms. We know that strange feeling of, of disconnection 
that comes when our hearts feel torn between hope and despair. When we know that we should feel hope, right? That's We're here in church. But we can't hear the bird singing the tune. Or it may feel like that little bird has had its wings clipped. Or we may tremble to look within ourselves for fear that we'll find the perch empty and feathers all over the ground. Prior to the scene described in today's gospel reading, Elizabeth and Mary have been visited by hope. The thing with feathers, which in this case was an angel named Gabriel, who might have had a broken heart, who knows, came to them and sang the tune with the words. Everything was quite explicit, visible, undeniable, not least of which because of the children now growing in their wombs. They can literally feel hope kicking from the inside. I'm not sure what it feels like for a child to leap for joy in the womb. As a man, I feel hopelessly on the upside of this story. But it's no wonder that these two women are overflowing with inspired words, with prayers, with songs. We find ourselves this morning in the presence of two women who are radiant with the divine promise, glowing, as it were, with the fruition of God's steadfast love for the world. I really think this is one of the most joyful stories in the scriptures. The lives of these two women have been illuminated by a profound mystery. It's one thing to hear someone say that nothing will be impossible for God. Even when the bearer of these words is an angel, it's, sh- it's hard for us to shake that human skepticism that wants to respond by saying, I'll believe it when I see it. Which, you know, doesn't necessarily come from being jaded. We may simply be weary. It can be hard to see the light of promise sometimes through the fog of disappointment and grief. The fog. I looked at my phone yesterday and it said freezing fog, and maybe that's what it feels like sometimes. So I guess it's one thing to hear the promise that nothing will be impossible for God, but it's quite another to find the word of God filling your own body. Or to find, as Mary does, the heart of God beating below your own heart so that your own fragile body is suddenly sustaining and feeding the body of God. We are no longer in the realm of the ordinary things that can be explained with charts and equations and reason. John Donne wrote a poem on the nativity, the stanza that begins with an address to Mary saying, a men city cloistered in thy dear womb. A men city. Here the God who made the heavens and the earth, the God in whom all things came into being, takes up residence in the same human flesh that gives us so much grief all of the time. The same human flesh that gets sick and sore, that breaks and rips and wrinkles and sags, the same flesh that we're always complaining about. Christmas astounds us with the promise that God does so much more than just reach down from on high to touch us with a blessing. Instead, God makes a home at the center of our lives, at the center of our lowliness, our weakness, and yes, even our disbelief. Maybe this is where we begin. Not with big things, with all those lofty dreams for our lives and for the life of the world. But with this aching back and with these tired feet and with this broken heart, with these feelings of emptiness, with the quiet affirmation that yes, 
God's word is growing within these same bodies, within these very souls. Sometimes we need to remind each other. It's easy to get hung up on the words of Elizabeth when she says to Mary, Blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. We might wonder what Elizabeth would say to us who may not believe quite so confidently or trust quite so deeply as Mary does. I find it helpful to remember that both Mary and Zechariah, Elizabeth's husband, when the angel told them what was going to happen, both of them responded by wondering out loud, how can this be? I also find it helpful to remember that the angel's promise of fulfillment was never contingent on anyone saying, let it be, as Mary does, or I believe you, as no one does. It was spoken as a promise. God is about to do a new thing. This is going to happen. God is going to bring newness of life. The injustice of the present order is going to be radically overturned. Those who weep will rejoice. And it's not going to happen in spite of you. It's going to come through you. Not because you're a paragon of faith and virtue, not because you're the most gifted person in the world, not because you're strong and powerful, but simply because God has blessed you. God has called you. God has spoken. I guess what I'm trying to get at is maybe the same thing that Emily Dickinson was talking about when she said that hope never asked crumb of her. What if we let go of the idea that hope is something that comes from us, something that we have to conjure up, something that we can possess, and therefore also something that we can lose, and instead consider that hope is something of heaven, that shines here because God has spoken it into being. What if instead of worrying about whether we have hope, we just accepted that that little bird is singing in there somewhere and let ourselves wonder at that fact, that a heavenly bird should sing in such a body and mind and soul as ours. The theologian Paul Tillich once gave a sermon about the message of acceptance that stands at the center of the gospel. I want to read you some of his words because I think they have something to say about how we might live in hope and expectation even when we struggle to believe that there is an angel with anything to announce to us or to our world. Tillich describes those all too rare, but beautiful, sometimes wordless moments when we suddenly become aware of God's presence in our lives. And he says, sometimes at that moment, a wave of light breaks into our darkness, and it is though a voice were saying, you are accepted. You are accepted, accepted by that which is greater than you and in the name of which you do not know. Do not ask for the name now. Perhaps you will find it later. Do not try to do anything now. Perhaps later you will do much. Do not seek for anything. Do not perform anything. Do not intend anything. Simply accept the fact that you are accepted. If that happens to us, we experience grace. After such an experience, we may not be better than before, and we may not believe more than before, but everything is transformed. In that moment, grace conquers sin, and reconciliation bridges the gulf of estrangement, and nothing is demanded of this experience. No religious or moral or intellectual presupposition, nothing but acceptance. My friends, as we look out on a world that has been transformed overnight, I pray that such moments 
may come to you. That when you feel that hope is a struggle, you will quiet your mind and remember the assurance that you have been blessed to be a bearer of Christ. That the word of God sings in you. And I pray that when you don't hear the bird song, you'll dare to trust that it abides, waiting, poised, perched in the soul, soon to sing again. Sure to sing again. Because Christmas is coming. Which is why I come to Sodom and Gomorrah. 
Their sin was grievous. You probably think you know what it was because it's stereotype, you know, lasciviousness, licentiousness, excesses, or Jesus. We're not told that. In fact, in the case, we probably would have been told that because there are very juicy and very explicit stories in our fabulous Bible. And nothing like that's mentioned here. We're told that sin is great. Their sin is grievous. God was very unhappy. They were not living righteously, so God decided to destroy those two cities. But God had a covenant with Abraham. He had said, I will be your God, you will be my people. And it was a kind of understanding that people of the covenant would try to live as God wished them to live. Which perhaps wasn't explicit enough, but it got the Ten Commandments later. We have a covenant here, too. It's in front of your windows. It starts, we covenant with the Lord and with one another. There are responsibilities on both sides. So God decided to tell Abraham his plan to destroy the two cities. Um, Abraham was taken back. And he began a negotiation with God. This is a very brave man. He started off his pitch saying, Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? And then he said, Well, just um, if there are 50 righteous people in these two cities, we just grab the cities. That's it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, 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 yeah, yeah. And he said, well, perchance we can't find five, how about 45? <laughs> and he keeps barking God down to 10, at which point I said, you better stop. But 10 was pretty good. 10 righteous people in two cities, they'll be spared. Okay. It also happened that Abraham's nephew, Lot, was living in Sodom. So God sends his, his angels, his messengers, to notify Lot in the way that you might not leave the city. <laughs> um, this is where we see one obvious sin of Sodom and Gomorrah. These strangers were not welcome. In fact, the mom wanted to tear them to pieces. And um, as it turned out, the four people got out of Sodom, and Lot's wife turned around and found what happened. Last Thursday, a group of us was here Rehearsing and singing to be recorded for Christmas Eve service, singing carols. The lights were on, candles were lit, we were making music, the dark door was wide open, as it always should be, and a stranger wandered in. His first words were, it's warm in here. Mm -hmm. You remember, remember it would snow that afternoon and then later like, that night, right? It became apparent he was seeking more than direction or just the answer to a simple question. Now, Jonathan was right here, rode with the camera. And he saw that, you know, whatever was going on with Doug down there, guy, something more was needed. So he came down from the pulpit, he rode slowly like an angel, I swear. He did. <laughs> As he went to meet and engage and welcome this person. Meanwhile, we see him up here. We're not finding anyone. We've got our coats off with the camera. And all the windows closed. And we're cold. And we're a little annoyed. It's like this guy is a distraction. And, and he turned out to be a little bit of a disruption as well. Then this revelation has its head very well with me. I'm not proud of myself. Our call is to welcome the stranger. Particularly at this time of year, when we think of Mary and Joseph and their Andrews and we think of refugees all over the world. And we remember Chipper's story from last week about the hippie who showed up at the frequency of service and it was nice people. They were not pleased to see him. <laughs> but Jonathan set a beautiful example for us. This is Advent. Traditionally a time of penitence, reflection, self-examination, soul-searching. There's an old prayer of confession that says, 
we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and we have left undone those things which we ought to have done. The sins of omission are much harder to not confess. So, Advent, stewardship, expectation, reflection, a time to think about what we bring to the table. And not just a phrase, our communion table, currently our, our home to the crash. A place where we share the body of Christ and the cup of the cup. The incredible thing to us. Merry Christmas, everyone. <laughs> I added a prayer of dedication to the Liturgy for today, which may seem strange since we're not passing offering plates, but something we've been talking about when service got, got shortened uh, when everything was, was virtual and uh, you know, we're still being careful about what we pass and what we, what we share and what we touch. Um, it's really a, it's an important part of our, of our liturgy because it's, just, it's one of those aspects of how we respond to God's word. And it's not just about our responses with the, you know, the things we put in the offering plate. It's so much larger than that. It's, it's this, this open question of how we want to live so as to make our whole being a joyful response to God's word in our lives and to God's generosity because this is how we know God as the generous one, as the giver of all good gifts. So let us pray. God, we thank you that when we gather in weariness to ask, is there a word from the Lord? We are met with love, with good news, with assurances, and with the blessings of peace. God, we pray that you will bless all of our responses to these gifts so that every aspect of our lives may be dedicated to your loving promises. And so in some small way, bring glory and honor and blessing to the one we will soon see born in Bethlehem. His name we pray. Before I share the, the prayer requests that were handed, hand, thank you, handed to me, I wonder if any of you have joys or prayer concerns to raise to Jason. Appreciation and, and really protection in a sense related to the family. Um, 
I don't float, it's the rose. <laughs> so. Thanks for that. Others. Some other prayer concerns that were were given to me. Uh, Janet Anderson raises prayers for her friend Chris. We keep in our prayers uh, our our friends uh, Kenneth uh, and Susan, who uh, even though they, they can't be with us here, are, are with us in spirit. Yeah. I, think, I think that was two separate prayer requests. One for Sorry, my name right. Oh. Okay. Oh, I see. I see the little hashtags. Prayers for Chris and prayers for Janet Anderson. A prayer for Hannah, for all nurses, doctors, and healthcare workers in this country. Prayers for Lorene, who's going through radiation treatment. And prayers for the health and safety and freedom of Julian Assange. Let us let's gather our hearts in prayer. Holy God, look upon your children in mercy and tenderness. For we come to you burdened with so many cares, broken with so many failures, wearied by the weight of so much loss. We want to see your glory before us, O oh God, but we struggle sometimes to see. God, come to us in your compassion. Fill us with your peace. Restore us by the indwelling of your spirit. Bring healing, courage, strength, that we may rise up to answer your call to be loving servants of others, to be bearers of Christ, to practice forgiveness. Welcome. 
compassion. We thank you, God, for coming to us in the prophets and the apostles who taught us to care for the orphan and the widow, who taught us to weep with those who weep. And it is in their spirit that we now pray for those who are most vulnerable in our world, for those whose griefs have brought terrible loneliness. We remember before you those who hunger and thirst, who shiver and cold, who are afflicted by sickness, who are estranged from family and friends, whose lives are in ruins from storms and from human acts of violence, and those who are beset by the darkness of depression. We remember before you, God, those who have suffered losses in this season, for whom the joy of Christmas may seem like a distant land. Lord, we raise to you prayers of thanksgiving for Euler's well-being and for Jason that they may both continue to experience healing and to be strengthened. We raise to you those who need your comfort and care, remembering Jean, Rosemary, Chris, Jen, Julie, Kenneth and Susan, Lorraine, God, we pray to you for the well-being and strength of all the nurses and doctors and medical workers who help to keep us safe and to serve those who are sick. God, hear our silent prayers for peace and healing. God, give us grace Give your peace, for we pray in Jesus' name, saying as he talks, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Let us this day our daily and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation. And deliver us from you. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. We sing number 114 in the Pilgrim Hymnal Lift up your heads, ye mighty gates. i 
to join us out on the front steps to sing some carols. Bring your hymnal with you and I'll be outside. Sisters and brothers, take heart and dare to hope against hope for God has looked with favor on our loneliness, blessing us with a, with a love that breaks every chain and endures every storm to bring us to joy to bring gladness to the ends of the earth. So go in peace, for the faithful one is drawing you.